All right, I think we can get going here. Um, I'm very excited to uh, be the moderator for today's uh, spotlight event, modification to the NCPDP retail pharmacy standards and adoption of a new pharmacy subrogation standard. Uh, we have got a few introductory slides. Um, you've all seen this slide, but I'll remind you that um, you could make a strong argument that if it wasn't for Weedy, we wouldn't have the robust health IT environment that we have today. Uh, back in the early 90s, um, then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, uh, called into his office some of the key leaders in healthcare and said, hey, we've got to make this system more efficient Efficient. We've got to standardize. We've got to move to more automated processes. And that led to the development of the working group for electronic data interchange, which uh, developed two reports, which were then folded into legislative language, which made its way into something that we know and love called the Health Information um, Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA. So we've had a, a hand in the beginning of what was the revolution towards moving healthcare uh, uh, to electronic. Uh, we continue to be an advisor, as you all know, uh, to HHS, and we have uh, performed that role for, for uh, many years. Next slide. Uh, and again, as you all know, uh, the way we work is through consensus. Uh, our goal is to provide a platform so we can bring together uh, the various uh, healthcare stakeholders and identify the challenges and come up with solutions. And we do that through um, our work groups and sub work groups, uh, our task groups, our open public forums, our conferences and virtual spotlights like the one uh, you're attending today. Um, and uh, we are active in uh, producing testimony and comment letters. And I would encourage you to go to our website and review some of the comment letters that we've submitted uh, recently. And you can see here, we have um, a vast array of uh, stakeholder types involved with Weedy, including practitioners and hospitals, uh, health plans, uh, state organizations, uh, labs, uh, go government entities. In fact, we have ONC and CMS um, on our board of directors, uh, vendors, including clearinghouses, um, SDOs like NCPDP and others as well. Um, I would encourage you to uh, get involved if you're not already in one or more of our wonderful work groups. We have uh, now 18 um, and you can find uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion and a lot of very important work being done in these work groups. Um, and again, I would remind you that uh, every one of your colleagues within your organization is also a Weedy member. So for, for, you know, if you have a colleague that has a particular interest in a subject uh, like prior authorization, um, like property and casualty, uh, like telehealth, um, every one of those uh, colleagues can be part of a work group. So keep, keep that in mind. If you're interested in these, uh, reach out. We've got Sam on the line uh, here. Um, and you can go to our workgroup community homepage to learn more and to sign up for uh, these workgroups. Um, as always, uh, we see ourselves as the collective voice of health IT. Again, our role is to bring stakeholders together uh, to affect change. And uh, you can learn more about us and, and learn about our recent activities by going to uh, weedy.org. Um, these types of sessions, we really try to make interactive. Uh, we have uh, a unique opportunity for you to ask questions, to raise issues about uh, this. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat feature. We capture that uh, chat as well, so we can use it if, if you want to make a, a comment that we may want to include in our own comment letter. Uh, please uh, feel free to include that in the chat. Um, as always, uh, slides and recordings will be emailed uh, to you after the event. And with that, uh, it is my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Margaret Weicker has been a longtime advocate and participant 
um, at Weedy, and we've appreciated having her expertise uh, for, for uh, many years. Um, she's a recognized expert on the, um, uh, the retail pharmacy standards, and she uh, comes with us, comes to us uh, from N NCPDP. So with that, Margaret, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Weedy, and thank you participants for taking some time out of your day to hear about um, the NPRM. Uh, we are proposing modifications to the NCPDP Retail Pharmacy Standards, uh, which is the telecommunication standard. They also incorporate the batch standard and then the adoption of the pharmacy segregation standard. This is an NPRM or a notice of proposed rulemaking, um, which is soliciting comments. Um, they, HHS has put out what they are proposing based upon NCPDP's request, NCBHS testimony and NCBHS letter to HHS. Um, as part of the process, People review the NPRM, uh, provide comments to the NPRM, and then after the comment period closes, depending upon the number of comments, uh, the type of comments, then a final rule is released where changes from what was proposed could happen or they could finalize what they proposed. So that's kind of a very quick high level of the process. Uh, next slide please. So um, the regulation, the NPRM uh, reference number is CMS-0056-P. Uh, the pro proposed rule would adopt, as I said earlier, updated versions of the retail pharmacy um, transactions that were originally adopted as part of uh, HIPAA, which is uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Uh, the updated versions would be modifications to the currently adopted standards for the retail pharmacy transactions of healthcare claims and encounter information, eligibility for a health plan, referral certification and authorization, otherwise known as prior authorization, and coordination of benefits. Next slide. Um, the proposed rule would also broaden the applicability of the Medicaid pharmacy subrogation transaction to all health plans. Um, the rule would rename and revise the definition of the transaction. And it would also adopt an updated standard or actually a new standard. Um, that would require state Medicaid agencies to use it as well then as an initial standard for all other health plans. Uh, comments are due January 9th of next year. You can believe it's gonna be next year very soon. Um, next slide, please. So the provisions in the rule um, they're adopting is the telecommunication standard version F6, the batch standard implementation guide, which is version 1.5, and then the batch standard pharmacy segregation implementation guide, and that's version 1.0, and that would be for all health plans. So the proposal would uh, replace the existing adopted standards of the telecom uh, version D0, um, the batch standard version 1.2, and then the um, batch standard Medicaid subrogation implementation guide version 3.0. Next. Um, so in regard to the timeline, um, they said they stated that if the proposal would be adopted, it would require the covered entities to comply 24 months after the effective date of the final rule. Small health plans would have 36 months after the effective date of the final rule to comply. They also um, put in some cost information 
So they estimated that the overall cost to move to the updated versions and the initial adoption of the standard would be approximately $386.3 million. Uh, some rationale for that cost is they based it on the fact that you would need to do technical development, implementation, testing, um, there would need to be some training, and then there would be a 24-month compliance timeframe. Um, they asserted that the HIPAA covered entities or their contracted vendors have already invested in the hardware, software, and connectivity necessary to conduct these transactions. Um, next slide. So um, the proposed rule also talks about the improvements or the benefits of adopting uh, the newer versions of the standards. So when they referenced the telecom version F6, um, they listed three improvements. Um, controlled substance claims. Uh, we did refine the quantity prescribed field, uh, which would allow uh, all controlled substances um, to be reported. And it also distinguishes uh, multiple dispensing events for a single field, which obviously would increase patient safety. Um, they also uh, reference the fact that we have very specific fields now associated with taxes, regulatory fees, and medication administration fees. And then we increase the dollar amount, and this would simplify the coverage under the prescription benefit of new innovative drug therapies priced at or in excess of a million dollars. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, and this is not in the rule, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the actual, they, you know, they had three, changes or three benefits associated with the standard. And there's a lot of changes being made to version F6. You know, in fact, um, you know, like 300 different types of changes have been made between version D0 and version F6. So I'm gonna, you know, next, up, next couple of slides, I'm gonna go through some of those changes. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the eight-digit IIN. Um, the IIN is a replacement to what most of us in the industry call the BIN, and probably will stay BIN for several years. Um, but this is an actual ISO standard. So several years ago, they changed the name from BIN to IIN, and because they were running out of numbers, they increased the field length from six digits to eight digits. So in version F6, we made the change uh, to the name as well as to the field length. And there's a couple of other fields in the version F6 telecom standard um, that also reference the IIN and those have been changed as well. Product identifiers, we increased the length to 40 characters. Today, it is 19. Um, this was primarily done to support the uh, UDI-DI transmission on planes. Um, the total prescribed quantity remaining was added for controlled substances, and this allows the processor or payer to identify the accumulated prescribed quantity remaining. Uh, we added a field specifically for the prescriber DEA number. Um, it, it is a situational field. It is used in controlled substance claims where prescriptive authority validation needs to incur. We added a new segment to the eligibility transaction or the E1 transaction called the response other related benefit details. Um, this was done to support CMS's enhancements to the eligibility data that they are providing to the transaction facilitator. Uh, we added 
14 unique fields to support plan benefit parameters. Um, these would hopefully reduce telephone calls to the um, help desk from both the prescriber, you know, the pharmacy, the processor. Um, the same information a lot of times is verbally communicated today. So this would allow distinct fields um, to come across for this information versus relying on phone calls or message fields that you'd have to parse. Obviously, this would expedite patient uh, access to care. It would lower administrative costs as well as facilitate compliance with plan policies. Uh, we added fields to support RIMS, uh, which is the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy operation, as well as the PDMP reporting or prescription drug monitoring programs that exist um, in, I believe, all states today. And then uh, we also added uh, fields to support the association of a partial fill claim billing to the original billing. Uh, next slide. So in the past, we had um, tax amounts and they were very specific um, to a specific type of tax. So what we've done is we've modified it now to support different types of, of tax amounts. Uh, we provided uh, fields for reasons for formulary alternatives, as well as what those formulary alternatives were. Uh, we have payer identification fields, and these are done to support information reporting transactions. Um, 340B, uh, this is an alert that was added to identify um, when the pharmacy had provided 340B drugs. Um, as previously stated, uh, we have increased the dollar appealment amount to support uh, claim billing, service billings, you know, any type of billing that is over $1 million today. Um, we also have made modifications to support multiple patient identifiers from different enumerated entities on a single transaction. And we also increased the state license numbers for prescribers and providers um, to 35 characters in length as we have found that many states um, are increasing um, their license numbers. Next slide. So at a more high level of our benefits is we modified the coordination of benefit fields and their, and some of the segments to support the maturing COB environment. And this will assist the pharmacies as well as downstream payers. Uh, we made enhancements to the response segments to supplement the messaging um, that occurs today in the free text fields. So we codified that information as much as possible to increase workflow automation within the pharmacy. Uh, we, as I stated earlier, we made some enhancements to the eligibility request as well as the response. And this is to allow better benefit identification as well as to assist in the coordination of benefits. Um, we added some enhancements to the claim segment um, that'll provide additional information to improve patient safety. For example, the opioids um, prescriptions. We also made changes, as I said earlier, for sales tax amounts. And this provides clarity around the type of tax as well as who's paying the tax or who's responsible for paying the tax. Um, we also have made modifications to the pricing segment. Uh, we have added um, basically a qualifier and a pricing field um, to where you would state via the qualifier what the price field indicates versus having distinct fields for pricing. Um, this provides flexibility in the long run because we can add qualifiers to that field 
to where some kind of new pricing field is needed uh, or pricing cost avoidance field is needed, uh, we can do that without modifying the base standard. Um, we can support uh, the UDI now, um, which will, since the NRIC number is being um, sunset by the FDA uh, for identification and they're moving to the UDI, we can now support the full UDI DI without any sort of transformation um, to that number. Uh, we harmonize the prior authorization number field length and type to match what X12 has in their standard. Um, we added a segment for RINs processing as well. Um, we also required the support center help desk information uh, be returned on all transactions. Um, and so that would mean in a response, regardless if it was paid or captured or rejected, um, it is mandatory to send back um, your help desk numbers and what type of help desk it is. For example, if the reject is due to an eligibility um, problem, um, then the um, eligibility help desk phone number would be returned versus the general, my claim rejected, I'm not sure what this reject code means, um, type of query to a help desk. Um, so next slide. So we also, as I've stated previously um, today, we have drugs out in the market that are over $1 million. In fact, one was recently released and it was $3.5 million for a dose. Um, so today, it, when that claim comes through and it's for the pharmacy benefit, um, there has to be a workaround um, because the pricing fields in the transaction don't support a million dollars. Um, today, some are dropping those type of claims to paper and sending in a paper claim. Others are having to split it and then have special processing on the back end um, to actually handle the payment of that claim. Um, patient safety processes have been enhanced as well as access to care has been expedited um, through our increase in workflow changes that we made um, to fields, um, adding them, uh, adding qualifiers to be more flexible. So we've expedited patients. And then of course the IT development, testing and implementation burdens are reduced or we sure hope that that's what's gonna happen in the long run. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about subrogation. So today, um, the current adopted standard is the Medicaid Subrogation Implementation Guide. And that was adopted to support the federal and state requirements for state Medicaids to seek re reimbursement for the correct responsible health plan. Um, some of you may know it as pay and chase. The Medicaid pays it. Then they go and they chase the dollars with who should have paid it because in, there's a few instances where Medicaid is not the last payer of resort, but I would say probably 98% of the time Medicaid is the last payer of resort. So the current regulations only required Medicaid agencies to adopt the standard. Um, so what... See, HHS is proposing is to take the standard that we said to um, adopt for subrogation because it's we made it so it's not specific just to Medicaid and apply that to all health plans. So next slide. Um, so they're proposing to change the name of the transaction because today it's Medicaid segregation transaction. So they're going to change it to pharmacy segregation transaction. Um, the definition would also change because it's very specific now to Medicaid's 
So what they're proposing is to leave the Medicaid pharmacy subrogation transaction definition and add the proposed for the more general pharmacy segregation transaction. Next slide. So our first poll, and this concerns the segregation standard. So I, as I mentioned earlier today, um, only Medicaid is required um, to do or to implement the segregation standard. Um, yes, NCPDP did modify that standard um, to allow all health plans um, to do segregation. At the time we did that, obviously we had other health plans involved in this, and they stated, you know, we had a discussion around should this be all, should we recommend all, or should we just stick with the Medicaid's? And the entities that um, participated when NCBDP held these discussions um, said, you know, we really want to have some time to test this, to modify our systems, to modify our processes. Um, to, you know, many of them said today they get Excel spreadsheets. Um, sometimes they get paper. Uh, so they felt like there would have to be a lot of automation done on their part, and they didn't want to be mandated to do something with a very strict timeline. So when NCPDP submitted um, the DISMO request, as well as then in our testimony to NCDHS about this, we requested that it would only be for Medicaid use. Um, and as I stated in the NPRM, they are stating it needs to be named for all health plans, not just Medicaid. So with our, our first poll question, um, and that is, do you support the segregation standard being named for all health plans? And that's a yes or no. So Mike is going to launch, and there it is, um, the actual poll. So if you would click on yes or no. Okay. So Michael can end the poll and 75% of those voting um, stated yes, that it should be adopted for all health plans. So, Michael, if you want to stop sharing the poll. So then, close that. So then, um, compliance date is our next polling um, discussion as well after I, I finish this slide is for version F6 and the batch equivalent of version 1.5, uh, HHS is proposing a 24-month compliance time frame, And that aligns with the recommendation that NCBHS made in its May 17th, 2018 letter to um, HHS for version F2. So just a little bit of background, if, if you're not already familiar with it, is NCPDP originally requested um, version F2 of the telecommunication standard. And then approximately two years after we had testified at NCPHS, we submitted a new DISMO request um, and uh, NCPHS obviously held hearings again to adopt version F6. We, in our request to adopt version F6, we requested a three-year implementation timeframe, where in F2, when we testified, we did testify for a 24-month compliance timeframe. Um, there's consider, as I said, there's considerable changes between D0 and F6. And the biggest change in F6, I think, is the dollar fields. And the dollar fields are so pervasive 
in all of our systems, um, downstream systems, recording. I mean, if you just think about everywhere where you have dollar fields for a pharmacy transaction, all of those would have to change. Uh, you know, simple report layouts would have to change. Otherwise you're gonna truncate um, uh, dollar amounts and won't get the full picture. So they, uh, in our timeline, and NCBHS recommended, which was based upon our NCPDP's recommendation, was to provide a three-year pre-implementation window following the publication to allow version D0 and F6 to be used for an eight-month eight period after the three years. And this would allow live testing, transition period, and then require full compliance um, by the end of that third year um, after that eight month period from the three years. Next slide. So our next polling question has to do with that. Uh, do you support a 24 month compliance timeframe? a 36 month compliance timeframe or some other compliance timeframe. Okay, I'm not seeing the numbers. Oh, they're moving. Just getting ready to say close it down, but they move. Okay, yeah. So 75% supported the um, 36 month compliance timeframe. Next slide. Um, subrogation and their compliance timeframe, because that's a little bit different than the telecom and the batch. So the proposal there is all health plans, except those that are classified as small health plans, would be required to comply with the new standard 24 months after the effective date of the final rule. Small health plans other than small health plans that are state Medicaid agencies would be required to comply with the new standard 36 months after the effective date of the final rule. And the small health plans and the additional 12 months, that's part of the original HIPAA. So it's not something that's just done like for this NPRM. You will see that and basically all of the uh, HIPAA, HIPAA-related NPRNs in regard to small health plans and allowing them um, to have that additional 12 months. So um, our next polling question, and this is for subrogation. So do you support a 24-month compliance timeframe for all health plans except small, a 36 month compliance time frame for all health plans except the small or other another time frame um, other than the 24 or 36. And the numbers moving. So the results of that poll was the 36 month compliance time frame. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Next slide. Um, as in all NPRMs, um, there is a section on cost and the regulatory impact analysis um, that they created. Um, I urge all of you all to look at the cost. Um, NCPDP does not comment on the cost. Obviously, we're not an entity that's implementing 
Um, so health plans, vendors, um, providers, clearing houses, et cetera, um, go in and look at the costs that they estimated. And if you think they're you know, not right, whether they're too much, too little, um, they just missed the boat on it, um, please comment. Um, they, had they have stated in the rule that they couldn't find a lot of information around cost um, for the pharmacy sector. So um, they used what they had. And so if you have some numbers, look at that, um, that, please provide it, but also realize your comments are public. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Um, but I urge you all to go in and, and look at that piece of it as well. Next slide. Um, NCPDP created a SNP committee. If you all were involved way, way back when we originally started HIPAA and the transactions, we formed a SNP committee and had many little subcommittees around the, each transaction, the X12 transactions. Um, so NCPDP formed a SNP committee modeled after the WEDI. Um, and they are responsible for looking at our HIPAA uh, NPRMs, comments, making recommendations. Um, they also look at things that are associated um, not only with HIPAA and, and those transactions, um, but with other transactions that have been adopted by federal agencies like CMS Part B, um, the script transaction, which is the electronic prescribing transaction. So we have what we call a collaborative workspace. Um, the URL is on your screen. Uh, you do not have to be a member of NCPDP to join the committee or participate. So uh, if you are a participant, just go in and update your user profile um, and select NCPDP SNP. Uh, if you are not a member yet, uh, go in, enroll. It's very little quick process, you know, name, email, company, and then um, as part of that, then you'll be taken to where you will update your user profile and select NCPDP SNP. And you can join other task groups as well, not just SNP. So next slide. Um, HIPAA updates. Uh, NCPDP did a webinar, I'd say uh, right before Thanksgiving, uh, around the HIPAA updates. Um, for, from the pharmacy standards. So we did a really deep dive into eligibility and the change in the header, which is related to the IIN change, um, to the billing transactions, both the, the input, the request, and the response. Uh, we did uh, reversals because there are some changes in regard to reversals and the tracking of reversals and how you match reversals. Um, so there's a set of um, classes, so to speak, um, that were created and were given, and the webinar is are um, available on demand. So you can go to our website under webinars, and you will see those. Uh, and they, like I said, they are available on demand. Next slide. And this would be the final slide. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for participating and joining today and listening to me talk about the NPRM. Um, so I think there was a couple of questions I think I saw flash pretty quickly in the chat. Um, but if you have questions or just need in additional information, um, just send an email to standards at ncpdp.org. Okay. And now back to Rob. Margaret, yeah, thank you for that excellent uh, presentation. We do have a few questions. I've got a couple as well, but Don has asked uh, the proposed rule names specific dated versions mm -hmm. of the three implementation guides. The versions available at NCPDP have progressed past those dates. Will NCPDP be making the specific dated versions available during the NPRM comment period? Um, during the NPRM comment period, uh, you'll have to go pull the current version that's out there. And if you go to the appendix, you will see what has changed. And what has changed is what we're calling administrative modifications. For example, we found a spelling error. 
uh, we found uh, a wrong field identifier um, being used, you know, an O and a zero. Uh, we found a couple of times where we didn't put the right name of a field. Um, so if you go and look at the appendix, you will see what has changed and you can see that these are basically administrative changes. The substance of the transactions did not change. They were more, you know, editorial type of corrections. Now in NCPDP's comments, we're going to ask that they move to that latest and explain that these are, you know, editorial corrections, administrative type of corrections, but somebody, you know, that's not very familiar starts looking at this, they could easily get confused, especially with field names and field identifiers. So we thought it was important um, to go ahead and, you know, keep it up to date when people find these things and make the, the correction. But substantive changes have not been made between those. Excellent. And it, I know it's been a while since uh, you did make the recommendation to mm -hmm. N NCVHS. So, uh, Things move slowly on the government side. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, uh, Don has asked, uh, pharmacists can now bill uh, for some medical services. Will they continue mm -hmm. to use the 837 or will the new NCPDP format support medical billing? It will support medical billing. Um, typically, if the service is part of the medical benefit, it gets billed on an 837. If the particular benefit is part or the drug or service is part of the pharmacy benefit, then it gets billed using the NCPDP transaction. Um, we've talked to some entities about supporting um, the NCPDP transaction for what would be considered part of the medical benefit, um, but haven't had a lot of takers yet because our transactions are typically real time. And when I say real time, I mean like real time, three to 15 seconds and you get your response back. And typically your 837, which can be done real time, but it's primarily done in a batch mode. So it all goes to what, you know, where is it covered? Is it covered under the medical benefit or the pharmacy benefit? And that tends to drive which transaction you use. Excellent. Um, Margaret. Early in the presentation, you talked about one of the benefits of F6 uh, on the controlled substances um, area. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you go into maybe a little more detail on that and how it will impact, you mentioned patient safety and maybe the opioid crisis itself? Mm -hmm. Well, what we've done is we've added some fields that support how many pills have you received and how many are remaining in your prescription because sometimes that gets lost um, and the you know and the payer can track it. We've also added fields for what's called morphine equivalent dosing. So I may go to Dr. A, I may go to Dr. B, or I could go to both Dr. A and B, which is a, sometimes what you see with pill shopping. Um, and we've added fields so that on the back end, the payer for that can do the accumulation, can do the math in regard to the equivalent and say, wait a minute, these, they're being totally overprescribed. What is going on? You know, don't fill that prescription or call the prescriber um, and see why this prescriber is, you know, also giving 30 pills with the same um, dosing uh, strength as well as the other prescriber type of thing. So we're trying to put in fields, edits on the back end to try to alert because what we found is a lot of times that alerting wasn't taking place or the alerting was being ignored um, because they, you know, alert fatigue uh, happens in the pharmacy. So trying to make it a high level alert um, even rejecting it to say, you need to look at this a second time versus, you know, oh, we'll pay it and go ask the prescriber sometime. And a pharmacy just doesn't have time to do that. So um, we tried to add the fields that we thought would help in regard to that, as well as the validity of the prescriber actually prescribing controlled substances, because not <laughs> all can do that or should do that. Even. You know, 
I think that's that's so important. Um, as Weedy uh, is is trying more and more to to um, uh, reference the patient perspective and experience and their voice, um, I could see this as being a very important component of of F six and a a strong argument for why it should be adopted in the final rule. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that I would yeah I would suggest that might might be part of our our comment as well. Um, I've got a question actually for the audience uh, and it's on subrogation because the options um, on, on the poll um, was was sort of uh, sh should it apply to all health plans? Um, I guess my question and if you can and uh, maybe um, audience uh, use your thumbs up uh, if you agree, should we be recommending that it be optional or voluntary for, for plans other than Medicaid. So it would still be available if a health plan wanted to use the transaction, but it wouldn't be mandated mm -hmm. on them. Uh, I'd be interested to see from the audience if, if that would be the approach that Weedy should, should take in our uh, response to, to the government. So thumbs up if it should be voluntary. And I'm assuming, Michael, that they can uh, that feature will will work. Yes, if they just click on their reactions, okay, reaction, reaction button on the, the toolbar. Yeah. All right. They may not be sure. Uh, yeah. By by the look of it, but um. Um and. Uh, Again, you you did a nice job, Margaret, of, of explaining how folks can can get involved. Uh, can you talk a little about your, your volunteer groups and how they operate, and uh, how you're able to sort of bring stakeholders together, much like like Weedy does, and you, of course, fo focus on the pharmacy space. Yes. Um, so obviously, we have members, um, and there's a, a membership fee associated with it, but. The industry is much bigger than, you know, typically people that can come to a meeting and that type of travel, that type of thing. So we created uh, what we call a collaborative workspace, um, which allows anybody, I mean, they don't have to be in the pharmacy industry even. Um, when we've had some, what you would call patients, um, actually attend some of the calls um, where anybody could join any task group, our work is primarily done in our task groups. So our structure is work group, task group. So a work group typically has multiple task groups and a task group tends to focus on a specific area. Uh, we have an eligibility task group, um, information reporting, and we have a government programs work group. And under that, we have task groups for Medicaid, um, Medicare Part D, we have um, FAQ type of task groups where I have a question about a standard and it could be any of our standards, but it's kind of divided among the expertise. Of the and you bring that forward, we answer it. Um, our task groups are consensus based. We may take a straw poll, um, but typically we don't vote. We ask for consensus. Um, they develop documents as well, you know, best practice, guidance documents. Some task groups develop standards or white and white papers as well. So what we try to do is, you know, hey, this is what we're working on. Um, this is the type of people we may need in a particular task group, um, like professional pharmacy services and billing for services using the telecom transaction, because what we've seen is, some of the Medicaid's have started paying for some of the consultations that pharmacists do. Um, but what we have found is a lot of the pharmacies did not implement um, the NCPDP service billing. So it's kind of a catch-22 uh, there. So we formed a task group to look at that and to provide guidance to the pharmacies as well as to the PBM payers processors on how to implement that transaction since it wasn't one of those widely implemented. So we put out a call, um, consensus-based, anything like a white paper standard, et cetera, does get voted on at the work group. 
and you do have to be a member to vote at the worker level. But like I said, you know, our the bulk of our work happens at the task group. Um, there are virtual meetings. There's no in-person meeting uh, for task groups. Uh, some of them have a cadence, you know, I meet every Monday, I meet every two weeks, you know, on time frames. We have a calendar out there on our collaborative website that shows you when all of the task groups meet. Um, there's a listing of all the task groups with a description. Sometimes the name of them isn't obvious what the actual task group purpose is. So there's a document that explains that. So um, I urge all of you to, you know, become more involved, to look at our listing of all of our task groups. We have 72 task groups, I think, as of last month, um, that work on different aspects. We have a segregation task group um, as well. So join us. Uh, the more the merrier. All opinions are welcome. In fact, we like to hear all opinions because sometimes, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, so it, it's important to get different perspectives. Okay, fantastic. And uh, again, um, I will say that uh, this is a, a unique opportunity to ask questions about this proposed rule. Uh, I'll give it uh, just a couple more seconds here if you have a last question for Margaret. And if not, uh, I wanted to uh, remind folks uh, that we have our Weedy annual meeting tomorrow afternoon, uh, 60 minute kind of overview of the year from a budget and programming and advocacy perspective. I would encourage you to, to attend that. And with that, I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to thank Margaret, a wonderful job as always. And thank, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with the audience. I wanna, I see we have uh, Leanne Stember in the audience. Uh, thank, Thank you, Leanne, for your long uh, time support of Weedy. Uh, Leanne uh, ser serves on the board. And with that, um, we will close today's spotlight. And again, thank you all for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at future Weedy events. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rob and Michael.